On Sunday, the 24th of November, 1963, two days after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, millions of Americans, transfixed before their television sets, witnessed something unprecedented. Murder live on air. He's been shot. He's been shot. Ray Oswald has been shot. There's a man with a gun. Absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Nightclub owner Jack Ruby had shot and killed Lee Harvey Oswald, the man who could have revealed what forces may have been behind Kennedy's assassination. Why did Ruby do it? Ruby claimed to have acted alone, out of a misguided sense of patriotism, to spare Jackie Kennedy the anguish of a murder trial in Texas. More than 40 years later, however, many people believe Ruby was really part of a conspiracy to kill the president. Nothing was more effective in destroying evidence than the role played by Jack Ruby in killing Lee Harvey Oswald. Some of those who are closest to the investigation insist that uncovering Ruby's role is the key to unraveling the entire plot. If he is part of a conspiracy, the assumption would be that there's a connection between that conspiracy and the conspiracy that resulted in the president's death. Two high-level official inquiries had already arrived at contradictory conclusions about the president's assassination and Jack Ruby's role in it. We found no evidence of a conspiracy, foreign or domestic. Jack Ruby murdered Oswald on orders from the mob. Did Ruby act alone? Or was he a contract killer assigned to silence Oswald? And have rogue elements in the US government effectively covered up a conspiracy to assassinate the nation's 35th president? The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motives, Eleven a.m., Sunday, the twenty-fourth of November, nineteen sixty-three. At Dallas Police Headquarters, Lee Harvey Oswald's scheduled transfer to the Dallas County Jail was already running one hour late. Finally, police were ready to escort Oswald into the lift and down to the basement, where a waiting police car would take him to jail. Meanwhile, 52-year-old Jack Ruby, a small-time mob associate from Chicago, was just around the corner at the Western Union office. It took him about two minutes to walk to the police station. Police were everywhere, as Oswald had received numerous death threats. Ruby, who had plenty of friends on the force, entered with ease, possibly through an alleyway door, and went into the garage. Ruby is connected to these cops enough that maybe the cops let him in because the cops knew him. Ruby blended into the crowd of reporters and police and waited for his opportunity. He's been shot. He's been shot. Ray Oswald has been shot. Five days later, President Lyndon Johnson appointed a bipartisan panel of seven powerful Washington figures, led by US Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren, to investigate the Kennedy assassination. The Warren Commission presented its findings in September 1964, concluding that both Oswald and Ruby acted alone. There was no conspiracy in either case. It was a conclusion that several investigators rejected at the time and still reject today. We took, a, I think, a more careful look at Jack Ruby, his background, and, and what he did that day. In the 1970s, G. Robert Blakey was chief counsel to the Congressional Committee that investigated the assassinations of both JFK and Martin Luther King. All the evidence together, the mob did it. Blakey and other experts on organized crime believe it was the mob who ordered the hit on President Kennedy and then assigned Jack Ruby to kill Oswald, so the assassination couldn't be traced back to them. 
Blakey's view is bolstered by a fact acknowledged even by those who accept the Warren Commission's conclusion that Oswald and Ruby acted alone. And that fact is that both the CIA and the FBI withheld information from the Warren Commission. They hid documents, they destroyed other material, they didn't tell the Warren Commission what was going on. It was a cover-up of their own nefarious illegal plots that they didn't want disclosed. For 11 years after JFK's assassination, the CIA and FBI successfully concealed this vital information. Long enough to make any criminal investigations impossible. The press, isn't this an outrage? And again, In 1975, a special committee chaired by Idaho Senator Frank Church found that in the early 1960s, rogue elements of the CIA hired the Mafia to kill Fidel Castro. This information placed the Kennedy assassination in a new light. It now appeared plausible that the Mafia, a silent partner of the CIA, felt somewhat double-crossed by the Kennedy family because at the same time the CIA was working with the mob, JFK's younger brother, US Attorney General Robert Kennedy, was spearheading a tough and successful crusade against organized crime. The Mafia was desperate in 1963. They were on the verge of extinction under the Kennedy administration. It was an unbelievably vigorous organized crime program that was arresting them, was convicting them, was keeping them under, uh, under surveillance. Blakey argues that the hit on President Kennedy was most likely engineered by New Orleans crime boss Carlos Marcello. And it had two purposes. One was to get even with the Kennedys. The other, to end Bobby Kennedy's war on organized crime. Carlos Marcello wanted Kennedy gone. If the tail hits you, the best way to stop the tail is take out the head. This time, uh, the committee will come to order. In September 1977, the House of Representatives set up a select committee on assassinations. The committee began its investigation into the president's murder by revisiting Dealey Plaza. The first thing you do is you, and this is what we did, is we asked where did the shots come from that hit Kennedy? The Warren Commission found that Oswald fired three bullets from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Blakey and his staff knew that if a fourth shot had been fired, it would mean a second gunman and a conspiracy. For Blakey, a fourth shot would help connect the dots all the way to Jack Ruby. The problem of the assassination is to connect, if possible, Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby. In February 1978, committee staff unearthed a radio recording from the Dallas Police Department dispatched on the day of the assassination. An initial analysis by one of America's top acoustic experts suggested that the recording revealed a fourth shot. He subjects that tape to a series of tests and he comes back and says, yes, there's a possibility that there are four shots and, and we have to test it. And I asked, what do you mean test it? We got to go to Dealey Plaza. So we went down and set up an experiment. After a day in Dealey Plaza spent recreating the sounds heard in the recording, the committee released its report on the 3rd of January, 1979. It stated that there was a high probability that a second gunman had fired a shot from the infamous grassy bank and concluded that Oswald most likely did not act alone. Therefore, Kennedy was probably the victim of a conspiracy. You have other witness testimony, and there's a substantial number of people. The principal location for the shots were the depository and the grassy knoll. Blakey believes that the acoustic evidence indicating four shots is explained this way. First, Oswald fired twice from the book depository, hitting Kennedy with the second shot. Then the gunman on the grassy bank fired once at Kennedy, but missed. Finally, Oswald fired a third time, and it was this shot that killed Kennedy.
But the gunman on the grassy bank, Blakey believes, had another target, and this second role for the second gunman makes Blakey's theory unique. His role may well have been to have shot Oswald when he's brought out of the depository, which is the standard mob technique. You have one shooter kill the man, and you have somebody else kill the second guy. Uh, that failed. As a result, Oswald was able to make his escape. Less than two hours later, however, he'd been arrested. According to Blakey, if the mob wanted to silence Oswald, they would have to breach the police cordon around the suspect. Will he ultimately turn and give the government the information the government needs to know that it's conspiratorial? The answer is yes. That's the risk that they can't afford to take. They have to take the risk of killing him in police custody. And that's the best explanation of, of Jack Ruby in the time after the assassination. He is contacted, given the, the contract, and now the man is making every effort he can to fulfill it. On the evening of Friday, the 22nd of November, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald was charged with murder for the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. G. Robert Blakey believes that the Mafia, primarily New Orleans mob boss Carlos Marcello, was behind Kennedy's murder. But the job was not yet finished. Although Oswald had only been in the Dallas prison for 10 hours, Blakey believes that a contract killer was already stalking him. Local strip club owner and longtime mob associate, Jack Ruby. He's always wanted to be connected. He's sufficiently separate from the mob that he would not leave the fingerprints of the mob on the assassination of Oswald. Violence and organized crime were parts of Jack Ruby's life. Born Jacob Rubenstein in Chicago in 1911, he was one of nine children who grew up in a tough Jewish and Italian neighborhood on the city's west side. He's a street brawler. He's a thug. At 16, Ruby left school. Some say it was then that he went to work for Chicago's biggest mobster. As a young teenager, Ruby was with a gang of youths that ran errands for Al Capone. Author David Scheim spent 15 years researching his book, Contract on America, which documents the links between Jack Ruby and the Mafia. His most significant organized crime connection as a youth was as an official in a mob-controlled union. In 1937, Ruby got a job as an organizer for the corrupt Scrap Iron and Junk Handlers Union. Ruby's role was to steal money, exploit workers, basically to skim off the dues and, uh, and manipulate the union. Ruby served three years in the US Army during the Second World War, then returned to Chicago, but not for long. Later, the House Select Committee investigation found it a distinct possibility that the Chicago mob kicked Ruby out of town. There were some reports of him being threatened or beaten up by syndicate killer Lenny Patrick. In 1947, Ruby moved to Dallas to help his sister run a nightclub. Over the next 16 years, he managed half a dozen bars and strip joints. There are several witness reports of Ruby beating up strippers, beating up nightclub patrons. Police arrested him nine times on numerous charges, including disturbing the peace, carrying a concealed weapon, and assault. He was really on nothing from the Chicago ghetto and running a third-rate strip tease joint. Carries a gun the whole time. His characteristic feature is impulse and violence. In one incident, Ruby got into a fight with a man who bit off the tip of his index finger. Of his six nightclubs, all but one, the carousel, lost money. Did he perhaps owe his business survival to his strong ties with a large number of Dallas police officers? Some 
dozen witnesses told the Warren Commission that Ruby was well acquainted with most of the 1,200 uh, members of the Dallas police force. The congressional investigators believed Ruby probably bribed the police, throwing in romps with strippers as part of the package. He gave them free dinners, free drinks. He was never prosecuted, even for assaulting strippers right in front of policemen. He was tight with the police. At the same time Ruby was courting the Dallas police, he was also nurturing a relationship with organized crime, which linked him to powerful New Orleans mob boss, Carlos Marcello. The women who appear in these strip joints uh, are on a circuit. That circuit was organized crime controlled. And now the headliner of our show, direct from New Orleans, ladies and gentlemen, Jada! The dancers at Ruby's strip joints, Blakey says, often arrived from a nightclub in New Orleans owned by the brother of Carlos Marcello. In fact, Marcello's New Orleans organization oversaw all the mob rackets in Dallas. Ruby was a frequent visitor and associate of Joseph Savillo, the mafia boss of Dallas. Ruby knew all of the major mob people uh, in uh, Dallas well. He, he knew extremely well uh, Joseph Campisi, the number two guy. The uh, deal of organized crime, I think it's a very serious situation to face in the country at the present time. In the early 1960s, while Jack Ruby was nurturing his mob connections in Dallas, the Mafia was coming under new, intense pressure from the U.S. Justice Department, run by the President's brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. A series of high-profile federal prosecutions in New York and Chicago had incensed the country's top Mafia dons, the so-called National Commission. They said they hated the Kennedys. They talked about killing the Kennedys. The Kennedys knew of the mob's animosity because the FBI had bugged their hangouts. But the bugs never picked up evidence that the national mob was planning to kill Kennedy. Robert Blakey believes he knows why. The plot was hatched in a bug-free environment, the opulent New Orleans home of Carlos Marcello. Is he just another mob leader? No. He's always had a kind of autonomy. He's not been subject to the national group. But this intense hatred of the Kennedys was something new for the Mafia. After the 1960 presidential election, Chicago mob boss Sam Giancana boasted that he'd been responsible for stuffing the ballot boxes on the city's west side, ensuring that Illinois went for Kennedy over Richard Nixon. And for two years, Giancana and President Kennedy shared the affections of the same woman, Hollywood actress Judith Campbell. Nevertheless, the Kennedys launched an intense attack on organized crime in 1961. Carlos Marcello felt the heat directly. In 1961, U.S. immigration officials arrested him in New Orleans and deported him to Guatemala. Taking the credit was Robert Kennedy. Marcello made his way back into the country, but he was furious. He was rabid with hatred for the Kennedys. It was at this point that Marcello may have started planning a hit on the president. Is it conceivable that he would do it on his own, out of hate for the Kennedys? Yes. This was not just business. This was personal. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The president is dead. Then, Blakey believes, at some point on the 22nd of November 1963, the mob offered its old friend, Jack Ruby, the biggest job of his life. He's always been a wannabe connected to them. Now he gets a chance to be, and he also knows that if he screws it up or doesn't do it, he's dead. About three hours after police had brought in Lee Harvey Oswald to the Dallas police headquarters on the evening of Friday the 22nd of November, strip joint owner Jack Ruby left his carousel nightclub. According to Robert Blakey, Ruby may have been on his way to meet with the Dallas mob who wanted to cover up their plot to kill the president by getting Ruby to kill Oswald. They go to him and say, Jack, we want you to do us a favor.
You know the cops. The cops come in your strip joint all the time. You give them free liquor. You can get into the police station. Shoot Oswald Forrest. You've got to take him out. Blakey believes the mob made Ruby a classic offer he couldn't refuse. Now, what does Ruby now know? He's been offered a chance to be a close associate. He's also got knowledge that they did the, the assassination if they want to take out the assassin. So he either knows I do it or I'm dead. A few hours later, at the Dallas police station, Ruby posed as a reporter while witnesses picked Oswald out of a lineup. Jack Ruby stalked Lee Harvey Oswald. After the lineup, Ruby left police headquarters. Shortly before midnight, he returned for Oswald's scheduled press conference. This photograph captures Ruby as he again mingled with reporters. Ruby spent the rest of the night talking with friends, who later testified that he seemed fixated on the death of the president. After very little sleep, Ruby drove to Dealey Plaza, where he saw all the memorial wreaths piling up. He reportedly cried as he headed back to police headquarters. He is giving every indication to the people near him that he's under enormous pressure. At the station, Ruby waited. It was rumored that Oswald would be transferred at 4 p.m., but the transfer never happened. The following morning, Sunday, at just after 11 a.m., Ruby parked opposite the Western Union office, just around the corner from police headquarters. He knows, I think, when Oswald is being moved because the cops told him. Ruby entered the Western Union office and at 11.17 a.m. wired some money to Karen Little Lynn Carlin, one of his strippers. Then, for the fourth time in three days, headed towards police headquarters. Once again, Blakey says, Ruby was looking for an opportunity to fulfill his contract with the mob. He could have got him in the other three. Why didn't he do it each of those times? I don't know. Maybe it took a little more nerve to do it the last time. At 11.20 a.m., television cameras rolled as the lift door opened and Oswald emerged, handcuffed to a detective. about it. Oswald has been shot. Oswald expired at 1.07 p.m. He died at 1.07 p.m. We have arrested the man. The man will, will be charged with murder. Who is he? The, man, the suspect's name is Jack Rubenstein, I believe. He goes by the name of Jack Ruby. Six days after Ruby arrived at the Dallas County Jail, he received one of his first visitors, Joseph Campisi, the number two man in the Dallas mob. Somebody has to go in and comfort him. And that's exactly what Campisi did. He has got to keep Ruby on board. Ruby's volatile. He's succeeded in doing what he's doing. He's got to go talk to him. Jack, you're our friend. We're with you. Blakey thinks Campisi's visit was also meant to underscore a threat. The local cops in Dallas at this time are corrupt. They're being paid off. And so when he is in the local jail, he is vulnerable to being taken out himself. Earlier, Ruby had claimed that his motive for murdering Oswald was simple. He wanted to spare the first lady the agony of a public murder trial. Over the next few months, defense lawyer Melvin Belli and his co-counsel Joe Tonnehill agree to represent Ruby. He's a very intense man. He's a very tragic man. He's a very emotional man. He's a very generous man. Joe Tonnehill wanted Ruby to plead guilty to the lesser charge of murder without malice. There's no uh, uh, statements made or anything done that showed any premeditation. 
And all they had was this emotional man shooting this guy, and that would be murder without malice. If the strategy succeeded, Ruby would serve as little as two years, not an uncommon sentence for a mob-connected defendant. But his main lawyer, Melvin Belli, decided to present a case for a full acquittal on a plea of temporary insanity. On the 14th of March, 1964, after a 10-day trial, the case went to the jury, who reached a verdict in about two hours. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder with malice as charged in the indictment and assess his punishment at death. The jurors never heard from Jack Ruby. But in the months to come, Ruby would hint that he had secrets about the assassination that he wouldn't or couldn't divulge. The people had, had so much to gain and had such a material motive for putting me in a position I'm in. We'll never let the true facts come of our board to the, to the world. In June 1964, more than six months after the assassination of John F. Kennedy, members of the Warren Commission, including Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren and then Congressman Gerald Ford, traveled to the Dallas County Jail to question Jack Ruby. We asked him, did you murder Lee Harvey Oswald because of any mob connections? He said no. Ford believes Ruby was telling the truth. But Professor Robert Blakey and others maintain that Ford and his colleagues missed a golden opportunity to finally get the truth from Ruby. All through the interview, he says, get me out of here. Take me to Washington. I'll tell you what happened. And it's, he, he denies uh, any conspiracy or anything in it. But if you read it carefully, you can read he's saying things indirectly. Get me out of here. I'll tell you the whole story. Earl Warren said, if you believe your life is in danger in talking to us, then I would advise you don't tell us anything. This is the chief investigator for America talking to the, one, probably the single most important witness in the case. Don't talk to us. In the end, the commission decided not to take Ruby to Washington. More than a year later, in September 1965, after the Warren Commission had announced its findings, Ruby gave a press conference. <laughs> Uh, in other words, I'm the only person in the background that knows the truth pertaining to everything relating to my testimony. In 1966, nearly three years after Oswald's murder, an appeals court overturned Ruby's first-degree murder conviction on a technicality. As soon as he received a new trial venue, Ruby hoped to plead guilty to the lesser charge of murder without malice and walk out of jail with time served. But the 55-year-old Ruby was seriously ill. In December, he was admitted to hospital where doctors diagnosed terminal lung cancer. Three weeks later, Jack Ruby was dead. Those secrets about Oswald's murder died with him the questions about his motive did not. In 1979, the House Select Committee on Assassinations re-examined the evidence and concluded that Kennedy was most likely the victim of a conspiracy. The report even suggested that Ruby was ordered to kill Lee Harvey Oswald to prevent Oswald from talking. That finding drew a blistering attack from critics. Somehow they read into that the final evidence that there's a 95% certainty that, the, that John Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy. I say to you, it's just balderdash. This type of speculation, it might have been this, it might have been that, has got to give way to some sense of evidence. In 1993, author and lawyer Gerald Posner published Case Closed. His review of the evidence led him to conclude, like the Warren Commission, that Oswald and Ruby each acted alone. The Oswald murder is a spur-of-the-moment act that takes control of Ruby almost impulsively. According to the House Select Committee report, 
The conspiracy that links Jack Ruby to Lee Harvey Oswald begins with a shooting in Dealey Plaza. The committee concluded that a recording made during the assassination proved the likelihood of a second gunman. You can look at the dicta belt and analyze it, and that will give you the timing and direction of the assassination. There were two shooters in the plaza. The acoustic says it happened. In 1980, the Justice Department asked the National Academy of Sciences to review the acoustic data and verify the committee's findings. It couldn't. In fact, the NAS determined that the recording may not be useful evidence at all. The impulses previously studied were approximately one minute after the assassination was over. But Professor Blakey disputes the integrity of the NAS's review and maintains that, in any case, there is more corroborative evidence of a second gunman. I just don't think that any of the acoustical studies since our studies have fundamentally undermined what we did. There's two shooters based on the acoustics, based on the eyewitness, based on the earwitness testimony. You can drop the acoustics out altogether if you want to. The House Select Committee also relied upon witnesses who testified that four shots were fired in Dealey Plaza from two different directions, which would mean two gunmen. But Posner disagrees. Here's the key statistic, I've always said this. 2% and only 2% of the witnesses at Dealey Plaza believe that the shots originated from different directions. Moreover, Posner says, Blakey's two gunman theory supposes that the second gunman, positioned on the grassy bank, was supposed to kill Oswald. But the grassy bank, Posner argues, would not have afforded the best shot at Oswald. Instead of placing him at the Texas School Book Depository, where Oswald is, place him away from the Texas School Book Depository, behind a fence, Oswald gives him the slip. Guess how? Walks out the front door of the depository. So if he's there to kill Oswald, he fails miserably. Blakey maintains that when the second gunman failed to kill Oswald, the mob had to hire Jack Ruby to finish the job. But Ruby's lawyer finds that hard to believe. The mob wouldn't put him up to killing somebody in the Dallas police station and then let him live three years after he killed him, I don't think. For Posner, Ruby's failure to shoot Oswald at earlier opportunities suggests that Ruby was working alone and not for the mob. He's ready to fill in the biggest assignment of his career. A man who always wants to be part of the mob is about to do a hit on the person who was involved in the assassination of the president and be the most important thing to the mob and be a made guy overnight. And Oswald walks eight to 10 feet away from him when they take Oswald out for a press conference and what does Ruby do? In fact, Ruby didn't shoot Oswald for another 36 hours, not, Posner says, the actions of a man on a mission. And when Ruby did get his chance, it was as the result of luck, not planning. It was pure happenstance, pure happenstance, that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was being transferred at the time that Jack Ruby got to the uh, Dallas police station. If he had been 10 seconds late, Oswald would have been in that car that was there and gone. Out comes Oswald with what looks like a smirk on his face and Jack Ruby's hat. And this fellow who's pulled off the murder of the president is smiling about it. Jack pulls out the gun and shoots him. Posner is also skeptical of Blakey's claim that mobster Joseph Campisi delivered an implicit threat to Ruby in jail after Oswald's murder. The mafia killed Jack Kennedy and Jack Ruby killed Lee Harvey Oswald on behalf of the mob. The last person you would have seen visiting Jack Ruby would have been a mobster. That to me has always been one of the best pieces of evidence that the mob wasn't involved. For Posner, the notion that the mafia had the competence to kill JFK is fundamentally flawed. If they had decided to kill the president and had even pulled it off, my belief, as firmly as I sit here, is that they are dumb enough to have had it unravel. They are not capable of this perfect crime. Critics don't dispute that after his arrest, Ruby offered hints and innuendos of a deeper secret he was hiding about the Kennedy assassination. But they say these were nothing more than the ravings of a man suffering from dementia, possibly brought on by the cancer spreading into his brain. He tried to commit suicide three times pending his appeal. Tried to put his finger up in the light socket, 
he ran his head into the wall and then he was making a hangman noose. And he was really deteriorating badly. He hears the screams of thousands of Jews being killed at night. He knows that because he personally hears those voices which have told him that it's in fact the Jewish people who are being blamed for this assassination. But Robert Blakey has another explanation for Ruby's erratic behavior in jail, including his suicide attempts. The stories about him uh, in prison is that every once in a while he'd start banging the, banging the things that people come see him, they give him what he wants, he would stop. I think a lot of his emotional explosions in jail were rational. They were ways of getting things. For over two decades, Blakey's critics have dismissed his theory of a mob connection to the Kennedy case. I got no stake in this. I say this is a way a reasonable person has come out after spending a substantial time, two years of my life and $5 million of your money, trying to figure out what happened and listening to things thereafter. This is the most plausible explanation. It's not the one I went in with. I went in thinking they didn't do it. And I found myself being persuaded by the evidence to the contrary. But even Blakey's critics are intrigued by startling new information released in 2001 that may link New Orleans mob boss Carlos Marcello, Lee Harvey Oswald, and the CIA. Now both Posner and Blakey are demanding answers. The agency has never cooperated in the investigation of the president's death. They're always hiding and protecting their own reputations at the cost of the truth, even when it comes to the assassination of the president of the United States. In the late 1970s, the U.S. House of Representatives investigated whether the Mafia and the CIA were in any way connected to the 1963 murder of President John F. Kennedy. A secret plot between the agency and the mob, a conspiracy to murder Fidel Castro, had recently been discovered. Some speculated that the two organizations may also have colluded to assassinate Kennedy. This is a conspiracy in which the mob was involved, and then we get into the mob's allies, the anti-Castro alliance, the CIA with which it cooperated in plots to kill Castro. Based on the information provided to the committee by the CIA in the 1970s, Chief Counsel G. Robert Blakey dismisses the notion that the CIA were involved. Our investigation in 1976 through 1979 did not indicate that there was a connection between Lee Harvey Oswald uh, and the uh, Central Intelligence Agency. But in April 2001, a Miami newspaper revealed that the CIA had in fact lied to Blakey and the committee. I do know now that everything that I thought back in the 70s, I no longer think. I think the agency double-timed us. In August 1963, 40-year-old George Joannides was a CIA operative living in Miami. On orders from the agency, he was secretly financing and guiding a violent commando squad of anti-Castro Cuban refugees called the Cuban Student Directorate and known by their Spanish acronym, the DRE. Like many anti-Castro Cuban groups, the DRE may have had ties to Carlos Marcelo, the head of organized crime in New Orleans. There are some significant people who played roles with the anti-Castro Cubans. Carlos Marcello financed uh, anti-Castro Cuban groups. According to Blakey, Marcello is also linked to Jack Ruby. The clubs that he dealt with in New Orleans and got his women from were owned by Carlos Marcello. The final element in this complex matrix of associations is none other than Lee Harvey Oswald who at the time was living in New Orleans. He had founded a local branch of a group that believed Fidel Castro was being treated unfairly by the US, and his activities attracted the attention of local media. On the 5th of August, 1963, Oswald made an attempt to infiltrate the DRE, a move that four days later resulted in a public confrontation with DRE members. This incident connects Oswald, the anti-Castro commando squad, and the CIA. 
The House committee was familiar with the incident, but it never knew about the CIA's role in this tangled web of associations, for the simple reason that the CIA never told the committee about it. Our investigators went over there. They were looking for conspiracy, and they were young and obnoxious, and they pressed. And I thought, when the agency complained to me, that they were too aggressive. The CIA then suggested a central contact person for the House committee. It was none other than George Joannidis. I did not know anything about Joannidis' background, and it's true that my researchers complained that he was not helping so much as not facilitating. Blakey says had he known Joannidis had even a distant connection to Oswald, their relationship would have changed dramatically. He would have been under oath. He would not have been a facilitator, and I would have wanted to know. When Oswald infiltrated this group, how did the group report up to Joannidis? What did Joannidis do or say about it? That information was never made available to us. Joannidis, of course, is now dead. Gerald Posner and Blakey agree that the CIA must respond to the revelations about Joannidis and his failure to divulge to the House committee any connection he may have had with Oswald. I don't know what their file said. Was he in a position to have stripped him? Yes. Was he in a position to have edited what got to us? Yes. So what do you conclude about the agency? You have to conclude that they don't tell the truth to the government for which they work about the most important single thing that happened in the 1960s, John Kennedy's death. The full CIA file on George Joannidis the Dre and Lee Harvey Oswald, a file that may clarify Jack Ruby's motivation, has never been released. And that's despite a law signed by the first President Bush in 1992 that mandated the release of all the JFK assassination files to the Assassination Records Review Board. For Blakey, the string of connections lends credence to his theory that the mob recruited Ruby to kill Lee Oswald. Gerald Posner, however, insists that whatever the value of the Joannidis information, there is still no evidence to substantiate Blakey's theory. They have to come up with an iota of evidence, a person, a telephone call, a scrap of paper, and 40 years later, it's just not there. It's often said that the conspiracy theories surrounding JFK's assassination give comfort to those who can't accept that a powerful and charismatic man could be brought down by a single crazed killer. Professor Blakey acknowledges that. What you have, I think, is the instinct that this couldn't have been John Kennedy, young, rich, powerful, brought down by Lee Harvey Oswald, poor, sick. There's just no balance between the two. Conspiracy would balance it out. Well, look, that's true. That's absolutely true. But the whether it was a conspiracy or a single assassin is not a question of our need for balance. It's a question of what the evidence is. Did invisible demons or flesh and blood conspirators drive Jack Ruby to kill? After two major government investigations, shelves of books and the passage of more than four decades, the truth about the Kennedy assassination remains beyond reach. And Robert Blakey believes it will stay that way. There's nobody left to tell the truth. What we're going to have is an incomplete jigsaw puzzle. We're not going to get the last piece in that will convince everybody, yeah, the mob did it.